<coughs> Hello, I'm Bill O'Donnell and welcome to another program on spirituality. This particular show has been a long time coming. <laughs> I think I asked our center guest here to come on as early as 15 years ago, but I think he thought uh, I wasn't ready, <laughs> or he wasn't ready, or we weren't ready. But in any case, I am thrilled to have today uh, as my guests in the studio, uh, Abbot Philip Lawrence and Father Christian Lisi from Christ in the Desert Monastery. Welcome to both of you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I, to get ready for this show, uh, which you can't possibly do, I mean, these guys are what you call uh, advanced recon in spirituality. They've been out in the field for a long time, and they're going to share some of that with us and some of the joys and the blessings and the challenges of monastic life. And Christ in the Desert has become a famous monastery around the world, even though it's 12 or 13 miles down a dirt road uh, up a <laughs> canyon, uh, but a delight. And I just re spent 48 hours out there just before this shoot, and uh, that 48 hours, uh, I'd rather be there than here doing this, but we're going to come and share some of this with you. So welcome, both Abbot Philip and Father Christian. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. All right. Uh, I have a book here that I'm going to bring to your attention. It's Brothers of the Desert by Maria Grania. Grania. Maria Grania that I'm just reading now about the monastery. It's a great uh, little book. It tells the history of it. That's uh, quite good. And also they have another brochure here on the Monastery of the Christ in the Desert, which I can also recommend to you. Um, they have, before we get started, I'll just tell you, they have a place called the Monk's Corner in downtown Santa Fe on Don Gaspar. And also they have a thrift shop. What's the name of it? The Community? Community Thrift Store. Community Thrift Store in Santa Fe, because these guys have to make a living as well as uh, <laughs> be great examples for us in our spiritual lives. So thanks for coming in and sharing. Um, we're going to do a first of a two-parter here. We're going to introduce you to the monastery with some footage coming up in a couple of minutes. But for that, uh, Abbot Philip, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got there. I went to the seminary at 14, which is not usual anymore, and I entered the monastery when I was 20 years old in Oregon at Mount Angel Abbey. And I was a monk there for 10 years, and then I volunteered to come to the Monastery of Christ in the Desert uh, to help out for one year. And uh, I've been here now 32 years, mm -hmm. and I'm still helping out. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, Mount Angel is a, a familiar place to us here in the Archdiocese yeah. of Santa Fe because they often send some of their seminarians there yes. uh, who now serve here. How about you, Father Christian, well, the prior at the Apicu? Uh Thanks, Bill. I, I came to Christ in the Desert in 1977, so that was almost 30, uh, 30 years ago, 29 years ago. I came in when I was in my 20s. I'd already been a monk for a few years at the same abbey as Abbot Philip. I took another journey for a few years trying to find the right place to end up. I knew I wanted a contemplative monastic community. And finally, a few years after Abbot Philip got there, here, uh, I came to Christ in the Desert in 1977. Been there ever since. Away for some of the time to do studies, but it's been home since 1977. I grew up in Oregon. That's where my family still is. Uh -huh. And where'd you grow up? I grew up in Washington State, okay. Oregon, Idaho, and Washington. I say I'm from the Northwest. You guys <laughs> are. Well, welcome to the Southwest, yeah. and you really have brought a lot <laughs> with you. So for those at home who have never been to a monastery, who don't know what we're talking about, Maybe it's time to just see a little bit of where they are and what goes on out there. Just as an introduction, only lasts about five minutes and we'll come back in the studio and you might even hear our voices describing what you're seeing uh, on the actual physical plant of Christ in the Desert uh, near Abiquiu, New Mexico. So go ahead and roll that, Marshall. Thank you. So we can talk over. Mm -hmm. so this is the sign as you come in. As you said, Bill, we live 13 miles off the highway, uh, Highway 84, almost, almost on the Colorado border, but in the Chama Canyon, still in New Mexico. It's out of the chapel, and this is just a, what's the name of that canyon? That we're looking out That's over the, at the Rio Chama behind those bushes. The Rio Chama, yeah. the Gaina. And the Gaina Canyon and the Rio Chama Canyon come together in one place here. Uh -huh. And that's what makes it wide, you know, so you don't feel closed in by the canyon on any side of you. And we're the only people who live here. We have one neighbor up. That's our guest master, yeah. Brother Andre. Been there a long yeah. time. And this is one of the retreat facilities. We'll see some of the retreat and what mm -hmm. you can expect if you go there on retreat. And we actually hope mm -hmm. that you will do it. It's a marvelous yeah. experience to get away for some silence and uh, prayers. And this small building was actually the original monastery. Yeah. And this was built as a guest house, the one you're looking at And this now. is the big guest house right there. Yeah. And then we'll have a quick shot of the courtyard as we... 
Yeah, there it is there. And uh, small rooms, but adequate for the needs. It's lovely, isn't it, out there? This is the common room in the guest for house. the guest house. Yeah. A small library there as well for the guests. Mm -hmm. And there's a retreat in there named Susan from New York. And here's Brother Rod Rodrigo, Rodrigo from King. Mexico. A couple days ago and Bill was there. What was I making? Spaghetti that day. I think so. hope it turned out okay. But this is a brand new kitchen, isn't it? This, now we're in the new area, right? Mm -hmm. we, the monastery was founded in 1964. And I came in 74. Father Christian came in 1977. 1988, we decided that if we were ever going to be able to make a go of it, we had to have a monastery that was built as a monastery. Mm -hmm. And so what you see now is a result of construction in the last 10 years, the dining room mm -hmm. uh, where we eat all of our main meals. Uh, for breakfast, the monks eat here and the guests have a separate dining room. But the main meal and the light meal in the evening we eat together. Mm -hmm. This was completed only a couple of years ago, but we began building in 1995 built and completed one part in 96. Tell us about this painting. It's a magnificent wall painting. This was done by a friend of ours representing various patron saints of our monastery and of the southwest of New Mexico in particular, including St. Francis and St. Clair. You see St. Kateri, Blessed Kateri Tekawitha on the right next to John the Baptist, St. Scholastica there in black, the sister of St. Benedict, our founder. Then the three visitors to Abraham in the center and Sarah there in the red and Abraham on the other side of her. From the Old Testament. Genesis 18, the mysterious visitors who come to Abraham and Sarah and tell them they will, be, uh, they will have a son. And this has been seen uh, as a depiction of the Holy Trinity in Old Testament times, a prefiguration of, mm -hmm. the, of the Holy Trinity. On the left side are the saints particular to our community as well, St. Benedict in black, St. Francis, a very special patron of our archdiocese. Blessed Juan Diego and the Blessed Mother. Okay, and here we are, we're seeing just the beginning of a meal, I believe, and you notice that you're served by monks. It's a little, and then you, you actually read or someone reads. During Somebody the reads. Uh, we're assigned by week, and this is the week that I was assigned to do the reading. Saint this ben is actually the prayer right before the meal. Yeah. Prayer before the meal. St. Benedict legislates in the rule that he wrote that the monks should eat in silence accompanied by reading, and so at our main meal each day uh, we have reading. So quite a few brothers were away the day you did this filming. Bill. We have 25 in the 25 community right now. Community. Some are away doing studies, some are visiting their families when you were there. A couple were in town doing shopping. Well, I want to, I want to acknowledge uh, Roger Gregory, who uh, did a lot of this work, and we really appreciate uh, his help on short notice, uh, just giving us some raw footage of uh, what we see here at the monastery. Mm -hmm. The guests eat with us at the main meal and the evening meal, which is taken in silence but with music uh, played some classical or chant played during that meal. Mm -hmm. And the brothers, as you said, Bill, wait on one another. It's a, also from our rule of St. Benedict that we're all in it together. We're all sharing in the work of uh, serving and cooking, cleaning. We don't have any hired work. These are our guests that were there that day, including a famous man there on the end. That was you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> there we are uh, Andre taking our meals. Yeah. Normally the abbot sits in the center yeah. place when he's There's not There's a lovely the stained glass window above where some of the that's right. That's by Margaret Nelson of Santa Fe. Yeah. You can't see it real well. You have yeah. to come visit the monastery to see that. We have brothers from all over the world who have joined our community, from Mexico, Vietnam, India, the Philippines, England, Germany. USA, Germany. At the end of the meal, we go and pray uh, a prayer, sing a song to Our Lady. There's a statue at the end of that corridor, and we sing to her and then go on and do the dishes. And After that, a little time for siesta. <laughs> And boy, it's needed too, isn't yeah. it? You guys are up so early. What time do you get up? 3.30, 3.40? 3.30, 3.40, the bell rings. Yeah. And we start prayer at 4 o'clock. The first prayer usually lasts about an hour. Okay. And all throughout the day, then we yeah. gather in church. All right, that's about it for that segment. But I just want to give you a little flavor, uh, just mm -hmm. a visual, to get a sense of what this is about. Because it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, the sense of humility when uh, you know a brother is actually waiting on you. He yeah. just put something in his apron and his, what do you call these things sleeves, on your sleeves? Yeah. Sleeves. sleeves, just to, you know, and you realize, you know, I should be serving this guy and oh, he's serving yeah. me. Thanks, that's, that's the feeling <laughs> you have. But it really yeah. was very wonderful to be there. So this is, this is primary. People have never been to a monastery. Part of the reason I wanted these guys to come in, one of the best things you can do for yourself is to take time apart and to get out of that stressful life that we're having now. It's just so busy and it is so quiet there. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not a Catholic, you're welcome there to come and to pray or not just to be with them. 
Uh, there's nothing like it. And there's no power there, so you better bring a flashlight. But in the mm -hmm. middle of the morning, at 4 o'clock in the morning, you're just heading for the chapel. And it's pitch dark. You remember uh -huh. the first time I was uh, uh -huh. doing a paper route. I never just the awe and wonder of being uh -huh. up in the middle of the night. Uh -huh. we, we don't have power in the guest house yet. We plan to do that. But we have to produce all of our own electricity, which we do with the solar electric system, which mm -hmm. is the largest private solar electric system in the state of New Mexico. Oh, is that right? We're going to yeah. show a little of that in a few yeah. minutes. But uh, eventually we have parts of the guest house wired up, but we haven't had enough money yet to, to mm -hmm. increase the electricity down there. But we have it in other parts, and, and we use it particularly for praying. When I went there, as when Father Christian came, we had only kerosene lamps, which is very romantic and lovely, mm -hmm. but very hard on the eyes. And so eventually we changed out the kerosene lamps. Secondly, the insurance mm -hmm. people don't like to insure places that use kerosene lamps and wood-burning stoves. Right. So slowly we're getting rid of all. Right. Now to set up this. for the next segment, tell us why you're there. Monks, I'll tell you what, what a monk is first. A monk is simply somebody in, in the early centuries who went aside because life was getting too easy and they wanted to, to follow Christ more, more uh, radically. And that holds true today. I don't think any of us would say life is easy outside anymore. Mm. Uh, on the other hand, we focus our day simply around praying and trying to understand Jesus Christ, trying to know him more intimately. And so the, the Holy Mass is really the center of our, our whole spirituality. But beside that, then we pray uh, seven times a day. We come to the church and we pray primarily the Psalms and then short readings from the New Testament. And it's keep us aware we should be praying all the time. Mm -hmm. See, now I, I came there, uh, as I said, I entered at 14, and, uh, but I've never lost a sense I should be a monk. I'm still looking for God. There are ways in which I can say I know him totally, and I'm delighted with him. There are other ways in which, you know, he doesn't seem that present at times. Yeah. But I keep trying to learn more about him and yeah. to know him. Let me just read a quick paragraph that we're not sure if, uh, if Father Christian wrote this or he picked it up somewhere else, but it's, <laughs> it's wonderful. It says, the monastic life sincerely lived in the silence and solitude of the desert brings to God the full weight of one's own and the world's weakness, sin, anguish, to present it to God for transformation and healing, turning all distress into peace, joy, truth, and light. Mm -hmm. Now that's a powerful statement. And that's why you're there. Mm -hmm. and, and explain to people by praying not only for yourselves, but for all of us, mm -hmm. we are actually indirect beneficiaries for your mm -hmm. prayer. Yeah. How does that work? <sighs> Thomas Merton said it works simply because in every tradition you have to have people who are holding the world together. You see, and, the, and they do that by simply being in the presence of God. And yes, we do intercessory prayer. If you come, you, you may hear uh, in the church, you may hear prayers from about different places in the world. But in our chapter every night, we receive prayer requests on the website. Mm -hmm. And so you may hear requests from any place in the world, you know, and, and they can be about sickness, about financial needs, about children, about parents, mm -hmm. uh, any kind of struggle, war, you know. Uh, murders, everything. It mm -hmm. comes there and it, it comes through. And, and our task is simply to hold that before God and ask uh, that God do something. And this is a whole tradition of prayer. You know, people will say, well, God never seems to do very much. They say, but the whole tradition, the Judeo-Christian tradition is say, God, you do something. Don't just be silent. You see? And we need people there to keep insisting that he be present in our world. Okay, so that's one aspect. The other aspect is then we must become transformed. You know, because if people come and they meet a bunch of cranky monks, you know, they say, well, they believe in God, but <laughs> not such a very good one, you see. And so we have to be transformed and convey simply by our own way of, of living and relating to people that, that somehow something has happened within my own heart, you see. So we, we work at personal transformation as well. Mm -hmm. Part of that quote, Bill, that you read is the reality that we come to the monasteries broken people ourselves in many ways. Mm -hmm. We're not perfect, we're not saints, but we come, as the abbot was just saying, to, to, to be transformed, uh, to be enlightened, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be filled with God's love and grace. But it doesn't happen automatically and it doesn't happen the day we arrive at the door. We struggle throughout our lives mm -hmm. to live at peace, to forgive, uh, to, to act in a Christian manner. 
Yeah, it's analogous in today's life. You know, people go to a gym to and get a fitness trainer to mm -hmm. help you work out and do something with your body. Well, my experience with these guys <laughs> was just being with them sure. inspired me in my own interior sure. life. Sure. And the discipline that you guys use in a positive way to overcome those weaknesses yeah, that we, we have. have. And extreme. we're encouraged by the guests who come yeah. as well. We yeah. hear their stories or we simply share with them and we, we feel encouraged to persevere because we're all on a journey together mm -hmm. in faith. You know, we see your vocation as important, different than ours. Our vocation is what it is, no better, no worse, but we're all struggling mm -hmm. seeking God together. So that's why we encourage people to come on retreat. Right. Listen, if you just join us, we're talking with Abbot Philip and Father Christian the Prior at Christ in the Desert Monastery. And we're going to go to another roll in here, another minute, to give you another deeper insight into what they actually do there in terms of their prayer life. So, Marsha, if you would roll that next one, it probably lasts about six minutes. And it'll give you a deeper understanding of how they spend their time at least seven times a day in the chapel. So let's see a little of that. Now we want the volume up to hear the bells, I think. Yeah, we just barely hear them back then. So yeah. that's Brother Andre ringing to uh, one of seven. Yeah, well, that was at the prayers at midday, I think. Mm -hmm. One o'clock, there's a short prayer together, and then lunch right after that. All the prayers are announced by someone ringing a bell. Mm -hmm. People generally have watches, but if they don't, they can pretty much live by the bell that they'll hear if, if they're close enough by. <clears throat> That's a shot you don't normally see because no, we're inside right. the uh, cloister. That's right. right. So the brothers see there. So these are some of the brothers from all over the world. That's right. You see Filipino, yes. Vietnam, America. Yes. Mexico too? Or Mexico, not in that particular yeah. shot. But brothers who stay will become U.S. citizens. Some already, when they arrive, they just come from other cultural backgrounds. <laughs> There's St. John, St. John the Baptist there? St. John Second. the Baptist, our yeah. principal patron. The monastery was founded on June 24th, 1964, uh -huh. which is the feast of St. John the Baptist. Okay, okay. And here's the glass on the upper part of the chapel where you look out into yeah. the, at the rocks. And, it's fabulous. Yeah. and the dawn coming up for, for the yeah, well, so we're on two sides of choir. I think we're going to see that in just a second. You saw one side of choir and then the second side of choir, of course, the crucifix. Yeah. Uh, so we know who's, who we're looking at here. Yeah. And then this is, of course, the tabernacle where our mm -hmm. Lord is kept. Yes. Which is the center point, really, of their lives. The other side of choir is brother from India, Mexico, U.S., Vietnam. And also a visiting monk. Too, There's a visiting California. monk from California, that's right. We sing what's called antiphonally from side to side. So here they're streaming out, and I think it's going to lead us into um, in the cloister where it's barely new, isn't it? Where you just built. Yes, this is within the last ten years. All of the construction you've seen so far, the chapel was finished in '68, mm -hmm. where we are now, and designed by George Nakashima, a very famous American furniture designer. <laughs> you saw some brothers in the shorter habit during the work time in the mid-morning prayer and the mid-afternoon prayer if one wants to wear the short habit that's fine otherwise we're in the long black habit for, for this is where the functions. brothers live now that we're looking at we call it the main cloister mm -hmm. and we have uh, cells for 22 brothers around the cloister here when we began designing this we were only five mm -hmm. and so we thought we would never get as large as 22 and now we're 25 and we've been as high as 32 and we go up and down but we always keep growing gradually yeah. You're seeing the solar panels also on the roof there that produce uh, hot water for the showers, for the heating in the winter in the floors, uh, hot water in the sinks in the rooms. Also a fountain in the center, that's a traditional monastic uh, feature of architecture, the living water is a reminder of Christ, the center of our life, who's the living water. Uh, the pump you can't see too well, but it's run by a solar panel also. Okay, the reason we shot this is where you come into church, church yeah. before you go in for Mass. Yeah. You guys are wearing your whites over your on a white cowl. Yeah. So this yeah. is the beginning of a Mass. It tells us this is called Scola? This is a Scola. It's just a small group of lead singers who, who hold the singing up. Everybody else sings with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, it changes from week to week. I'm almost always there, and Brother Kedman is normally there, but then we change the other one mm -hmm. off. So this is the beginning of Mass, just with some cuts to let, tell them why uh, the Eucharist and Mass is central to your life. The presence of, of God living for us in Jesus Christ by our faith beliefs. And we really believe that the bread and wine become body and blood of Jesus Christ. And so for us, it's, it's truly the living presence of Christ and it's the most sacred moment of the whole day. And we, we 
keep our spirituality focused on his presence. And uh, the challenge is, is to live that throughout the day. We always say you can't leave the Mass in the church. You have to take it out with you and live it. And I would say probably the single biggest challenge in a monastery is living with the other brothers. You see, it's not the work, but it's just living with other people. But this is what fuels you right here. The, this is the very center of our life. The daily bread we pray in the Our Father, give us this day our daily bread. Okay, we want material food. We all do. We all need it. But we more importantly need the spiritual food of the Eucharist. The rest of the Blessed Sacrament, as you pointed out earlier, is, is uh, at the center of the church, so there's opportunity for adoration through the day, and we have benediction every Sunday at the end of Vespers, benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. It's so very central to our life. This is really the fuel, isn't it? This is the, the fuel, fuel for the inner fire. In, for us, it's very important that the Mass be very beautiful. Now, now we switch to the back. Yeah, this is the uh, beginning of phase three, I think, yeah. where you, mm -hmm. you see some more. This is the most power. recent construction. Yeah, this is the yeah. front of the church yeah. and the chapel. And now we're going to turn into where the new area is. <laughs> and you see the first one to greet you is our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, wonderful painting. Yeah. This is where the guests and visitors, yeah. we, we kind of distinguish guests who are staying in the guest house and the day visitors. People are welcome every day of the week, anytime. Mm -hmm during the day, and uh, they come into this area where the uh, kind of the public space, the guest master's office is there, the gift shop, which is one of our sources of income in, in uh, our s survival. Right. So we encourage people when they go to bring some extra money because they're wonderful books and uh, religious artifacts that uh, they can buy there, or they can get them at the Monk's Corner in, yes. in downtown Santa, Santa Fe, and we encourage that. Okay, and there's some vestments there that, uh, I guess, who makes those for the priests that are coming? Well, okay. Friends have made those for okay, us according to it. our specifications. Right, well, I want to just give you an idea. There's a little more of a color look, um, mm -hmm. and anything that uh, brought to mind there from those visuals that people, that you've seen retreatants come from all over the world, literally, mm -hmm. to come and stay with for various amounts of time, you said, yeah. on a daily basis or for long periods, right? Mm -hmm. Probably the most impressive thing, I think, to a first-time visitor is the silence. You know, because it's so quiet in the canyon. Now, we, we have the propane generator back up to the solar electric, electric system. Sometimes you hear that, but generally when it's off, it is so quiet, I used to tell, but you can hear the birds fly. Mm. You know, it's so peaceful and quiet. And we always say, to be a monk in our community, you simply have to blend in with God's creation, which is already there, and sing praise back to Him. Mm. And so when a guest comes, we always encourage them, first, be quiet. Come at least to some of the prayers. You know, but listen, we don't give d uh, directed spiritual retreats, but listen, because it's listening that's lost so much in our culture today. So just be still. And lots of people find, of course, they can't be still, you know, but uh, it's a practice you know, that really helps. So at the center of our life is silence, solitude, even though we live together, spending time alone, and, and then this inner sense of praying all the time, giving thanks to God. See, and we encourage the guests to come how, uh, somehow come and share in that. I'd also say the, the fact that we have people come on a regular basis, maybe once a year, every few years, someone will come and I'll say, oh, I remember you because I give out the work assignments. If <laughs> guests want to work when they're with us, we give them gardening work or uh, maintenance projects, if they want to do those cleaning projects. So oh, you were here two years ago, a year ago or something, and I'll say to them, and they'll say, no, it was 10 years ago I was here last, you know. <laughs> but, but for many of them, it, it's a very regular nice. once a year, every few months, especially if they live close. Others, we've seen them, we see them once maybe and maybe never again for whatever yeah. reason. But uh, many of them come uh, on a regular basis because obviously they're being nourished mm -hmm. by what they receive at the monastery. And you put a lot of work into that road. I mean, that was the... Well, we didn't, but... <laughs> well, somebody did, because it's now... It's, 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 it's in good shape. It's yeah. good shape, and it's yeah. safe, and you could even yeah. come in a regular car now. Yes. yes. Yeah. It's a yes. forest service road, and they fairly regularly maintain mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, the, re the retreat area there is not just for Catholics. Mm -hmm. You know, when I first came to the monastery, I said we had about 5% Catholic retreatants and 95% from other uh, mm -hmm. religious denominations or no denomination at all. You see, now I'd say we're maybe up to half, half of our guests are, are Catholics, you see. But, but it's, people come because of the silence and the beauty that surrounds us there and just to be still and be recollected. Mm -hmm. okay. So what else would one expect or, uh, and, and why again do people want to be with monks? What is it? I mean, I was just there for 48 mm -hmm. hours and there was something that I felt in seeing the Psalms with you guys. Uh, 
over, kept going, kept going, kept going, mm -hmm. and something happens to you when you pray mm -hmm. those. What, what's, mm -hmm. what's happening? Lot, lots of theories on that. You know, they've been doing all these studies. There was just one issued again the other day about is there a hot, hot wired spot in the brain for God? You see, that doesn't seem to be true. Uh, there are studies, though, that indicate that the brain waves do change. You see, but as, as a follower of Jesus Christ, I say, I'm not interested whether my brain waves change <laughs> so much. But I know it affects people entirely. And, and if you go, to, say, to a Buddhist monastery, or Bon monastery, which is what I'm more familiar with, and you just hear the chanting too, there's something about that that can put you into a different space. Mm -hmm. And for us, it's always the purpose of being in that space is to know more about Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I say there are elements that cross over between religions, even non-Christian religions, but, but for us, it's very clearly, and this is why we have such a good dialogue with both Muslims and Buddhists and Bon monks, is, is because the fact that we are clearly Catholic monks. Mm -hmm. And so we try to understand our tradition, and then understand a little bit about their tradition. And guests sense that when they come. Mm -hmm. They sense the strength of the tradition of reciting these psalms, chanting them day after day after day. They've been prayed for, for what, 2,000, 3,000 years, mm -hmm. you see? Yeah, because I experienced it at a Hindu ashram in the uh, Bay Area, because I'd never experienced it. Mm -hmm. I was in my 30s before I even saw a monastery. and. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't know we had those uh, in our own yeah, tradition. Yeah, in our tradition, and know. in that many in that ashram, I did a little yeah. informal survey, and four to five of us were either Catholic or Jews. Mm -hmm. You know, trying yeah. to seek God in whatever way we could. Yeah, no, I think that happened very much in '60s, '70s, '80s. People were looking there, and, and many people never realized that our own Catholic tradition has monasteries such as our own, mm -hmm. in which the whole focus is simply on the chanting and the praying and and looking for God. Yeah, I could even make the statement that my guru sent me uh, ah. to the monastery because I was looking for it, yeah. and uh, and it's it, the other was a little more foreign, and this was somehow familiar. Uh -huh. Okay, and just in the few minutes we have remaining, we are going to have a part two uh, coming up where we'll go deeper into that monastic spirituality and talk to both uh, Father Abbott and Father Pryor here. Uh, it's not often we get specialists here, but this is sort of a high point for us here at Spirituality TV because we're here to encourage you in your spiritual life. And these guys are uh, not just pros, but they are uh, experts at <laughs> pursuing that spiritual life because they're doing it every day, day after day, year in and year out. And they're available for you if you want to come and share some time with them. And I recommend that you do that. So please watch the credits. Uh, contact them. Go to their website, www.christdesert.org. Correct. Christdesert.org. And go online and look... On the, they have a wonderful website. There's some teachings by the abbot and the prior, and you can find out more information. I do recommend that you go there on retreat, and also to consider them in your giving. Uh, they are a worthwhile uh, endeavor that I would recommend you go out to experience for yourself, and then you will know why we're having them here. They're here for us. They're here for people around the world, and, and don't hesitate to send them prayer requests because they will pray for you and they'll bring, as my older brother Jim used to say, industrial strength spirituality <laughs> to the fore. So on behalf of everybody here at Spirituality TV, I want to thank my guest, Abbot Philip and Father You're Christian, and everybody you. behind the scenes, our director, Marshall, and all our camera people and floor directors, all our volunteers. Thank you for viewing, and stay tuned next week for part two of Christ in the Desert Monastery on Spirituality TV. Thank you. <sighs>